family, she didn't realize that she would be embarking on a journey that would dominate her life for four long years. She faced a lot of dead ends, misinformation, and tight-lipped bureaucrats. But she persisted in her odyssey to find the truth about her birth. And to help other adoptees in their search, she's chronicled her story in a book called Reunion, The Search for My Birth Family. Madeleine grew up in Toronto. She now lives in Lennoxville, Quebec, and she runs a bilingual camp for girls in the Laurentians. She joins me in the studio this morning, and it's a pleasure to meet you. Well, it's very nice to see the face behind the doors. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you've had a long, long search, and now it's over. But let's, let's go back to the beginning of the story, Madeleine. Uh, when you were growing up in Toronto, did you know at that time that you were adopted? Yes, I don't exactly remember how old I was, but probably seven or eight when my parents uh, informed me of this. But during my upbringing, except on two or three occasions, it wasn't an overwhelming issue. Mm -hmm. I had wonderful, wonderful adoptive parents and a very, very happy childhood. So uh, it didn't bother you at all, uh, even after you found out? No, except there were there were things that would bring it up for example uh, someone saying oh my don't you look like your mother or look like your father <laughs> yeah. i used to think those uh, remarks were rather odd the famous family tree exercise in school which i gather is still a part of some school curriculums which maybe needs a little rethinking mm -hmm. because my adoptive parents had brought me up to have great pride in my adoptive family, which I still do, that hasn't changed, but because of that, it was almost a, a flip side of that was that I had, was getting more and more interested in what my other family was. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you decide to, uh, to actually go out and look for your birth parents? That came when my own daughter was born. Very consciously at that time, I thought, my glory, if this child was ever taken from me, how could I ever go through life not knowing what happened to her? And also along that so same side, I thought out there somewhere is somebody who has one been wondering about me. So my initial idea of reunion or of searching out my birth family was simply to tell this person that I had had a wonderful life, marvelous adoptive parents, and I was fine. Mm -hmm. Did it worry you that it might hurt your adopted family at all? Yes, mm -hmm. very much so, which is why, frankly, I never told them I was searching. And this is probably one of the greatest problems within this field of adoption. And there's a wonderful quote that says, adoption is like an elephant in the corner, which everyone pretends not to notice. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> well, there it is. And really, in looking back and with talking with other families now who uh, have been blended and adoptees who've spoken to their parents what happens so often is the adoptive parents would very much like to speak about it to the child who may mm -hmm. be 25 by now and they're afraid to because they're afraid they're going to upset the child or the young adult the young adult doesn't want to say anything because they're afraid they're going to upset the parent and so it goes so nobody says anything and there is just this hovering of something different in the family over all the time. And studies have been done that have found that adoptive families have felt more comfortable and more secure, not only when it comes out, but if they do go on to a, a meeting, that it's even more solid after that. But not all ad adoptees search, and, you know, I'm not advocating that if you're adopted, you've got to go out there. No. No, but if, if you do want to go out there, this is kind of a, uh, a guide to feelings and everything else that you've written. Yes. The, the bottom line is that I feel that we should be going through the recognized paths of the Ministry of Social Services Adoption Disclosure Registry. Mm -hmm. That is ideal because to simply, you cannot walk into somebody's life and say, hi, mom, I'm here, remember me. There are enough dysfunctional families in the world today without adoptees perhaps contributing to this in another family. But the whole question of medical information, medical records, I believe is a right, but this needs to be given through a social worker and then any question of reunion or contact can come from that. 
When you set out to find your birth parents, you checked uh, birth records at the hospital where you were born, and you discovered that your birth name was Atwood, and you thought that was your mother's name, which uh, sent you out on a long and futile search. Isn't that right? That's correct. Tell me about that. Well, the first thing I did was I, I assumed that if it were my father's name, that would be the easiest way and the easiest one to eliminate because if it were my mother's name, then we would have to go through the marriage and the change of names. You see, I did know that my birth parents married after the war, mm -hmm. so that uh, that was the link. But there had been a... My Atwood turned out not to be my father's name, and therefore I began to search. And I got the information to start me going on the non-identifiable information. The non-identifiable information is available to adoptees who contact the Children's Aid or the Ministry. And this gives the outline of anything which some social worker feels is safe for you to know. But an example, for example, your mother was musical and sang in a church choir. That doesn't help much, does it? Well, <laughs> or does right. it? Well, are, you know then they are on a registry somewhere as a church membership. Oh, yes, of course. They, my father I knew was British. The, you look at the statistics in Canada, the chances are that that would be Church of England. So you start getting into diocesan records for different parts of Ontario. And it's just chipping away at that big hunk of granite to try to figure out what little fossils will fall out. A chip at a time. Exactly. It takes tremendous patience. You, you actually didn't get very much help, did you, from the uh, bureaucracy? It was all very secretive. Oh, absolutely. Well, it is even today. Uh, birth records are sealed. My birth certificate, even now, I can never see. And the birth certificate, which I can see, frankly, is falsified records because it says that my birth parents are my adoptive parents. Those are the names that are on it. You know, uh, thinking about the whole thing and starting from scratch like you did and coming up against that uh, brick wall of bureaucracy and everything, there must have been times when you became completely discouraged. Yes, this is why a search really was an on-again, off-again thing. I mean, I run my own business and I had a young family, so that there was some calming periods. But I think the discouragement and the anger against society, I certainly have no anger against my birth parents or adoptive parents because they were trapped in the mores of the society. Frankly, exactly the way we are now. And that really is why I wrote this book, maybe as a catharsis to my own anger, but also to educate, because I don't think the public really realizes that there are 200,000 adult adoptees in the province of Ontario. That many. That many. And we have no medical historical records. It would be as if you took the population of Kitchener, half the population of Waterloo, stuck them all up in a field somewhere north of Elmira, rubbed out the, uh, their medical records on the computer and wiped out their background as to what their mom and dad told them about what happened to old Uncle Harry. <laughs> and then said, fine, go out and live. Yeah, the, the, the uh, problem is enormous, isn't it? It is. It really is, yeah, it's frightening. Yes, there are two, uh, I was at a meeting of parent finders the other day, and there are some buttons coming out. We're, we're beginning to get a little more militant, I think, on this. One button says, I don't know, doctor, I'm adopted. And the other one says, uh, dogs have pedigrees, adoptees have closed records. <laughs> Briefly. Let's go back. Uh, what were some of the steps uh, you went through to trace your family now? You started uh, with birth records. Yes. I started out by the traditional, legal, quote, recognized ways. I went to the Children's Aid Society. I got the non-identifiable information. I placed my name on the adoption disclosure registries. So, the, but once those two things are done, then what we are supposed to do, if we are good people, is sit back and wait for the process to go. But you didn't? But I didn't because I'm almost 50 years of age. This means that my birth mother is getting on and four and a half years, well, it was about eight years at that time, could, I could easily have missed her. Of course. Yeah. So what I did was 
I went through the birth, marriages, and deaths. I went to the area where I knew I was born. I checked through uh, libraries because the the non-identifiable information told me that my mother liked to read. Well, if she was still in the area, maybe she had a library card. I mean, I was very lucky my name wasn't Smith or Jones. (laughs) Yes, indeed. That would be big trouble. Or if you were down in the Maritimes, you're lucky if it wasn't McNeil. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) I understand you actually went to, to, uh, or investigated the Atwoods of Place Bay, my hometown. Oh, really? Well, interestingly enough, I was tracking down people and just writing off, and this very lovely lady from Glace Bay wrote me back. Yes, she, the, the Glace Bay Atwoods were one on the uh, on the family tree. But not the right one. But not the right one. You know, I was thinking if you, the Atwoods in Glace Bay had been the right ones, we could have been old friends because I know the Atwoods in Glace oh, Bay. Oh, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. Well, you probably know the person who wrote me the letter. Yes. Um, what was your big breakthrough? Where did it come? What was it? The big breakthrough, really, was when I discovered I didn't exist, I raced back to Children's Aid, only to discover that the person I had been working with retired, and I had someone who didn't know me, and I pulled in, I went upstairs, I parked illegally, I thought, I will donate a parking fine to Toronto, I am not going to waste time trying to find a parking spot here, and I went up and I said, this doesn't make sense. I've proved my father doesn't exist through the military records. I've proved my mother doesn't exist through the list of uh, women who were born on that time. Was I just given a Jane Doe name? And that does happen from time to time. And the social worker went out into the back and came back and said, uh, no, no, you, your name is Atwood. And I said, well, which one? Because <laughs> I've, I've eliminated both of them. There's got to be something wrong. I mean, I had yeah. gone back and looked through my records to see where I'd gone wrong and tried lateral thinking. And she said, I'm sorry, I simply can't tell you that. That's uh, identifiable information. And for once, I didn't say anything. And then she said, but if you ask me, I'll say yes or no. And I said, was it my mother's name? No. Wow. I said, then it was my father's. She said, I didn't <laughs> tell you that. Well, I sent her flowers, and I hope she doesn't get into trouble because oh. of that. But this is happening now where we're finding that people will put out, uh, a social worker will leave a file on the desk and say, gee, I've got to make a phone call. Um, it'll probably be about 10 minutes. <laughs> Madeline, uh, we've uh, underlined some... Uh words in your book here, a passage, and I, I'd like uh, if you'd read it for us. Uh, uh, fill me in at first and then go into the passage. Right. This was uh, the point at which I did phone my birth parents. So, parent, the organization Parent Finders, which I haven't mentioned, is uh, as one of the or- places where a ad- searching adoptee birth parent and and adoptive parent should go to for help they had given me a formula i had phoned them two or three days ahead and said i found her i found her what do i do now and they said the formula on how to do it what to say on what to say Mm. on how first of all to double check that this is a convenient time. I mean, if uh, she's got the bridge club in, this is not a good time. <laughs> Neither is 10 o'clock at night, because that is quite a thing to send an elderly person to bed with. So the suggestion was early in the morning, around 10 o'clock, let them get their heads together with the second cup of coffee right. and say, is this a convenient time because I have something to speak to you? that is relatively con- relatively uh, significant, and then to introduce yourself. So I had... Uh, gone through the general introduction. I introduced myself professionally as the director of Camp Woro, and I was calling from Lennoxville, Quebec, and at one point she thought I was uh, soliciting, and I asked her if she was familiar with the organization Parent Finders, and they, she said no, no, she didn't know that, and I thought, oh, help. And then I explained what Parent Finders was, and I was warned that sometimes at this point the other person might hang up, just out of sheer shock. Mm -hmm. And the word was, if they do that, you just simply phone back and say, excuse me, we seem to have been cut off. If they hang up again, you've got a problem. But that didn't happen to me. So I marched on, and my final, and she says she doesn't remember anything after my birth date. So anything that followed (laughs) didn't matter. But what I said was, I was born July 3rd, 1942, in Barrie, Ontario. 
and my birth name was Aline Patricia Atwood. I've discovered through several years of research that my father's name was Walter Ernest Atwood. I stopped. I had been advised to say my piece and then, shut up and listen, don't say another word. Wait, wait, wait. You are a voice out of the past, and there will be a great deal going on in her mind. Give her time to react. I waited, and really it seemed forever. It really must be Patricia. How wonderful. And I must say I will never, ever, ever forget that sentence. And it's just gone on from there, but they are, they are a very unique warm, strong, loving family, and I think that is why I was able to return to that family. It's, uh, yeah. it's very special. I'm just trying to imagine how you felt at that time. It must have been wonderful. It was. It's a, it's, in many ways, it's a wonderful odyssey, but it's also a how-to for people who are trying to do the same thing. Well, the bottom line is for adoptees, to go with sensible expectations. Expect knowledge, don't expect anything more, because then you are opening the line for hurt all over the place. And to go with sensitivity and with caring, and well, that's the bottom, should be the bottom line of life anyway, shouldn't it? Exactly. Well, it certainly had a happy ending for you. It did indeed. Thank you very much. Okay. Madeleine Allen lives in Lennoxville, Quebec. She's the author of Reunion, The Search for My Birth Family, and is published by Stoddard Publishing, and it sells for $24.95. Thank you very much, Madeline. My pleasure.